Good morning, and welcome to this special event commemorating National Medal of Honor Day. Today's fireside chat to inspire the future offers a unique opportunity to hear directly from three Medal of Honor recipients to deepen our understanding of valor, sacrifice, and the principles that guide our service to veterans every day. I'm Chris Halucci from the Veterans Experience Office. I'm a Marine Corps veteran and honored and privileged to be your moderator today. We'll first open with our national anthem, listen to opening remarks from Deputy Secretary Bradshaw, then go into our fireside chat, and then close with recognizing employees for their involvement in today's event. Next, please stand as I introduce Deputy Assistant Secretary for Governmental Affairs, Zanetta Adams, to sing the national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free Please be seated. Thank you for that great rendition of the National Anthem, Zanetta. Before I introduce our host of today's event, I'd like to share the very first time I met our Deputy Secretary. And ma'am, it was before we were online the other day, prepping. First, she's a very personable person and often takes the time to enjoy lunch at the VA canteen to interact and connect with employees. One day, we were standing at the chicken wing bar in the canteen, and I quickly thought about what I want to ask or share with her, and I blurted out, I like crispy chicken wings, of all things. To which we talked about chicken wings for a few minutes and had a great conversation. I was very appreciative that she indulged me in the conversation, but afterwards I thought to myself, of all things, to talk with the Deputy Secretary of VA, I bring up chicken wings. And boy, I hope she doesn't remember me or that conversation, but here we are. All jokes aside, it's her passion to serve veterans and commitment to connect with employees that is a testament of her servant leadership. The Honorable Tanya Bradshaw is VA's first woman Deputy Secretary, first woman of color to serve in the position, and the highest rank of woman in VA's more than 90 year history. A fourth generation veteran, Ms. Bradshaw, a combat veteran of the Iraq War, served in the United States Army for 20 years and retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. Since retiring, she served 
as the VA's Chief of Staff and in senior positions with the Department of Homeland Security and on the White House National Security Council. Ms. Bradshaw believes deeply in honoring our nation's sacred obligation to serve veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors as well as they have served all of us. Please join me in welcoming VA's 10th Deputy Secretary, Ms. Tanya Bradshaw. So for folks who know me well, they know I talk a lot about chicken. Um, and the tip is if you're ever at the Atlanta Medical Center, they have a chicken bar and it is amazing. So um, I love eating at the canteen and can't think of a better place for us to be able to not only meet our VA employees, but as well as to meet our veterans. And so good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, for those of us joining online, good morning to you as well. Today is National Medal of Honor. This commemoration was established in 1991 and March 25th was chosen because on that date in 1863, the first Medal of Honors, Medal, the Medals of Honor were presented to six Union soldiers of the American Civil War. 161 years later, it's a great honor for me to spend time and share a stage with three Medal of Honor recipients. Retired Colonel Harvey Barney Barnum, Bar, Bar, sorry, Barnum, United States Marine Corps, Medal of Honor recipient from the war in Vietnam. Can you raise your hand? We can properly recognize you. <laughs> Retired Master Chief Britt Slobonsky, United States Navy, Medal of Honor recipient from the War on Terrorism, Afghanistan. He is also the president of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. Britt, thank you for your leadership of the most distinguished organization. <laughs> and former Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts, United States Army Medal of Honor recipient, also from the War on Terrorism in Afghanistan. We are also honored today to be joined by a fourth Medal of Honor recipient and a fellow OCS graduate. Gary Mike Rose is here. So Mike, if you don't mind raising your hand so we can be recognized. We are so deeply appreciative of these men for joining us here today. They are always busy and this trip to Washington is no exception. In addition to joining us for today's event, they also will be laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery this afternoon, conducting their Medal of Honor Society Citizen Honorary Awards Dinner this evening, which I look forward to joining, and conducting Medal of Honor Summit on Capitol Hill tomorrow. So please join me in a round of applause for all of these heroes who've so generously given their time to be with us today. Let me also acknowledge and thank the Congressional Medal of Honor Society for partnering with VA for today's program. Veterans in attendance from the Armed Forces Retirement Home and Veteran Affairs Medical Center here in DC, please raise your hand so we can recognize you. <laughs> Mr. David McIntyre, President and CEO of TriRest Healthcare Alliance. Thank you, David, for joining us today and members of our VA Medal of Honor program team, a new program established by Secretary McDonough just last year. We're gonna take some time to award them a little later. This team works to assist Medal of Honor recipients and to help ensure all recipients receive the care and benefits they've earned through their distinguished service to our country. You'll hear more about the team members later on in today and here at VA, we need to remember why our department exists and what we're all about. We're about providing the best service to our American veterans. Because when young, young Americans sign up to serve our country in the military, we make them a promise. If you fight for us, we'll fight for you. If you take care of us, we'll take care of you when you come home. Our nation makes that promise. 
but it's our job at VA to keep it. That's why we exist. And our vision for the future of VA is simple, to provide more care and more benefits to more veterans than ever before. And no veterans are more deserving of VA care and services than those who have received our nation's highest award for valor, the Medal of Honor. Their actions stand as courageous examples for all Americans. We are better citizens because of their examples of courage, selfless service, and citizenship, both in uniform and after they've left military service. That's why we're here today. That's why our priority is ensuring the health and welfare of Medal Honor recipients and for every veteran. More care and more services for more veterans. Last November, Secretary McDonough spoke at the Medal of Honor Society's annual convention in New Orleans. And he reminded attendees that VA and members of the Medal of Honor Society are not strangers. We have an historic and enduring relationship. Some of our facilities are named for Medal of Honor recipients. All told, about one in eight Medal of Honor recipients from World War II generation ended up continuing to serve at the VA, including Herschel Woody Williams, the last remaining World War II Medal of Honor recipient prior to his passing in 2022, whose VA career spanned 30 years. And outside VBA's headquarters here in DC, we proudly display a plaque with the names of 98 Medal of Honor recipients who chose to continue serving other veterans at VA after leaving the military. So on this day, it's important to remember that a Medal of Honor recipients and VA have always been connected in very important ways. Today's panel is about strengthening those connections and our important relationships for the future. Gentlemen, we need your thoughts on how we can improve in the future. We want to be the strongest advocates for Medal of Honor recipients to serve you, your families, caregivers, and survivors and all veterans as well as you've served our country. So once again, thank you for allowing me to be here today. I have been like so excited, it's crazy. God bless you all, our service members and the nation's veterans. Let's get started. Okay, we have questions that were submitted from VA employees, uh, but we'll also take additional questions from our live audience. Uh, let's jump into our fireside chat, and my first question is for Britt. Britt, during the Medal of Honor convention in New Orleans, there was a community forum. Many recipients spoke about the Medal of Honor, uh, how the Medal of Honor was sometimes a blessing and a curse. Can you please elaborate on the pros and cons of being a Medal of Honor recipient? What is the positive side of receiving the highest award for military valor? Are there any downsides? Well, first, let me just take a moment to say, Deputy Secretary, lovely words. Th thanks, thanks to the entire team that put this together for us. It, it's just, it's, it's lovely being here. It, this is a, a little piece about just like coming home. I think so. Uh, th thanks everyone for allowing us this great opportunity to, to be with you all today on Medal of Honor Day. So, the Medal of Honor, to me, tell you a little bit what it what it means to me. It, I, it's a little uncomfortable place when you when you get the call and say the medal's coming your way. My first reaction was like, no. Right? Let, let me let me tell you about my teammates that were with me, those that were to the left and the right of me, those that followed me that day, those that perished on the mountain with me, severely wounded. I mean, we were a team of people. So when I think of the medal, there's the DNA of so many other people is embedded in that medal. You think of those that trained us, right? All of us that served, somebody trained you to do those difficult jobs. Their DNA is embedded in that as well, too. I think the very metal of the country is embedded in the medal itself. So that is, that, that is a little bit of the responsibility of being a recipient to tell those stories of your of your fellow teammates that were with you and to tell a little bit represent a little bit of what the represent a little bit of what the country 
really represents. So that's what being a Medal of Honor recipient means to me. But the, the best part about it, I would say, is getting to meet some of the great people across the country. We do, we do events like these and we spend a lot of time with veterans and our fellow citizens. And to me, that's, that's some of the best part, particularly when we go talk to children. It, it's just amazing. All right, thank you, Britt. Barney or Ryan, any thoughts or reactions? Anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I, for me, um, you know, after I got out, it was five years after I separated from my service that I received the award. And, you know, I'd gone full civilian, maybe didn't talk about my military experience a lot. But the award um, kind of elevates our voices and gives us an opportunity to highlight, as Britt said, so many other people and the great things that they do uh, and the whole team and show our, our appreciation. Uh, so it's, it's allowed me that opportunity to be connected uh, to the service, continue to be connected in otherwise ways that I didn't think that I would be. And it gives us an opportunity to elevate other people's voices. Awesome. Great. Thank you for that. Next question for Barney. Barney, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, Chris, uh, before I answer that, uh, I'd like to talk about legacy. I'd like you to look over my shoulder. There are two flags. One is the Congressional Medal of Honor Society flag. And the star on this flag, there are 13. We have 13 stars on our Medal of Honor. And that is our personal flag. And when we are present someplace, that is flown. So that's, uh, it represents, well, you know, my legacy. I hope I'm remembered as uh, someone who made a difference. Uh, a Marine's Marine. Someone who took care of the troops all the time. And I've always wanted to be known as someone who treated those troops uh, with firmness, fairness, compassion, and dignity. dignity. Uh, I was demanding. I always set my goals high, and I always reached out to get them. Never say it's too hard or I can't. And I've never, ever thought of or used the word failure. Integrity. Integrity, uh, to me, is probably the most important thing that I challenge myself to live up to. And I think that, sum it up, that I have, uh, I have lived by the Boy Scout law, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, brave, clean, and reverent. Charge on. Great, thanks, Barty. Thank you, Britt, Ryan. Anything you want to add to that question, as far as your what you want your legacy to be? For me, I think my, my legacy. I just want to say I was a I was a contributor. Wherever I went, I, I, I was a contributor to, to solve whatever problem that was there in front of me. So I just want to be remembered as a, a contributor. Great, thanks, and Ryan. Anything? To add? Yeah, I, I think for me it's important to. First, when I think of legacy, you know, all the other people that are with me that day, right? And elevating their stories and making sure people understand that, you know, I was just part of a team. I was just trying to keep up with everybody around me. I didn't give any more than anybody else. I just happened to be the guy that got that opportunity to do those things. I've worn this medal now for 58 years. It's not my medal. I wore it in honor of those great Marines and phenomenal Navy corpsmen that as a young first lieutenant, uh, in Vietnam, I got to lead. And I've often, when I have a tough decision to make, uh, especially when I was in the Pentagon, I would hold this medal and say, what were those Marines and corpsmen who died on the field of battle doing what I directed them to do? What would they say about this decision? And I was a political appointee. But in my heart, if the political people wanted me to say yes, do it on, and I thought the answer was no. I said no. I got taken to the woodshed a few times, but I did it in honor of those corpsmen and Marines from Vietnam. Well, thank you, Barney. Thank you all. Next question for Ryan. When people talk about you in history, what are the three things you would like them to say about you? 
Well, I, actually, funny, I, I would hope that they don't say anything about me. <laughs> um, I, you know, our, our position, good, bad, or otherwise, is kind of cemented in history once we receive the award. So I hope that it's the, the guys that I serve with and what we did as a team um, that history remembers, you know, specifically the nine that we lost that day, Sergio Abad, Jonathan Ayers, uh, Jason Bogar, Jonathan Brostrom, Israel Garcia, Jason Hovader, Matthew Phillips, Pruitt Rainey, and Gunners Willing. Uh, I think, secondly, again, not about me, but I hope that, you know, it's kind of ties into legacy that I can leave a wake behind me where I've made an impact, a lasting impact for other organizations and other veterans um, of empowerment. So, uh, just two out of three. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Barney, Britt, anything you would like to add? No, I think that, that says it all. Sums it up. I agree with him, this a contributor. Great. Okay, I think we have a couple of questions from our audience. Hi, good morning. So what is something since becoming a recipient that you have been able to do, um, some type of an opportunity that had you not been a recipient, uh, you wouldn't have otherwise gotten to do? Be here today. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't have had the opportunity, the platform to, to advocate for other veterans and talk about the service across all the branches, all the jobs, um, right? You know, like when we're in, everybody thinks their unit's the best unit, um, Marines. That's true. We are the best. <laughs> But to recognize that it, you know, it's a team, it's a giant machine, and you know, these wars are, are won and battles are won by people that touch the battlefield, but also the, the long line of people doing all the things every day, that, that just doing their jobs that they don't get recognized for. That's what wins wars. Absolutely. We have, okay, one more question. Good morning. From your perspective, how can VA staff and Medal of Honor recipients partner together and also engage other veterans to choose VA for their health care and services? Well, I, f first I gotta say, you have to take the step. As a veteran, you have to take the step and get the care. Sign up, trust the team, it's worth your trust. They will earn it very quickly. So I would say to those veterans that are out there that have not yet signed up for VA care, take, take the leap, right? There is a full team of people waiting for you. There's a full family of waiting for you to help take care of you in your next phases of life here. So I'd say just, just take, the, take the leap. For, for, the, for, the, um, for the staff on the other side of that, ha, as you're dealing with those veterans, I know sometimes you have some difficult days. I, I know you do, right? This is a very human business. And we can't forget at the end of the day that this is all that we do, right? From the military side, those are humans there that volunteer to put the, put the uniform on. From our side here, from, from the staff side, Hey, you're, you're humans as well too. So don't don't forget to be a human, right? That person is always reaching out for help. They have some problem that you can just help them through whatever challenges they may face. So I would say just continue to do what you're doing, continue to be humans, engage with each other, and then with that mindset, there's not a problem that you can't overcome. Great, thank you. And Barney, Ryan, anything you want to add, or Deputy Secretary? Well, you know, uh, the VA has been very good to me, and I can hear what's going on in here. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I respect uh, all veterans, uh, and they earn that title, veteran, by wearing the cloth of this great country. And we owe them the best. Uh, we all know there's been some tough times in the VA. Uh, there's been some people who didn't do what you expected them to do, they got fired. That makes a big impression on the veterans. Uh, a lot of times they'll talk about, gee, I went over to the hospital and I, was, I waited and waited and waited. But I said, but you got treated, didn't you? Okay. So you got to give to get. And, and uh, I appreciate what the department is doing. I know you want to do more, and we want you to do more. And we want to help you do more. Thank you. I, I got out of the Marine Corps in 2004, and it, it uh, took me until I became an employee of VA to actually seek to get some benefits. So uh, absolutely wish that I would have done it a, a lot sooner. Yeah. Yeah, you would like to, do I, oh, am I on already? No, I'm already. 
I don't think, oh, there we go. The only thing I wanna add is with the PACT Act, we have the opportunity to bring in more veterans than ever before. It is a huge expansion. And so, uh, especially those 9-11, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Gulf War, Vietnam, um, those that were exposed to toxins even while they were in their uh, bases at home, we just have a phenomenal opportunity. So if you are someone who works at the VA or out there watching, we really want to encourage you to apply to get the benefits you so richly deserve. All right, next question. Uh, this question, we're gonna go to uh, some uh, additional employee submitted questions. This question was submitted from retired Command Sergeant Major Will Valier. And this goes for any of you gentlemen. What inspired you to join the military? Well, I gotta tell you, a uh, senior in high school, and you know, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was thinking about the military, Parents want me to go to college. So uh, c career day on my senior year, all the senior boys are in the auditorium and the recruiters are in, Marine Corps, Air Force, Army, Navy, Air Force. Uh, and, and the, and the uh, Army recruiter gets up, starts to speak, and there's cat calls and whistles in the audience. And the Navy and the Air Force, the same thing. This old grizzly gunnery sergeant, Marine, stood up and slapped his hand on the table and said, there's no one in this room that I want my Marine Corps. And then he began to chew out the faculty in the back of the room for letting the boys get out of hand. Picked up his stuff and walked off the stage. Wow. It, on the way out of the auditorium, I see him packing up his stuff. And I went over to ask him a question. I don't remember what the question was. But I, hear, I thought, here's a man who's mission-driven, doesn't take anything from anybody, and he's just a dedicated professional. Call a spade a spade. I said, you know what? I'd like to be like him. <laughs> so I joined the Marine Platoon Leaders class program that day. Went home and told my parents, and they said, I thought you were going to college. I said, I am. The program is for college students that don't have a ROTC or Army ROTC on their, on, on their campus. And you go to uh, Quantico, Virginia, uh, two summers, and that's the boot camp for officers. And then you go to officer school. So I was commissioned a second lieutenant upon graduation from St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. And the rest is history. Thank you for sharing. And Britt, Ryan, anything you want to contribute? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Selfishly, my inspiration was called the GI Bill. Uh, like Barney, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I came from a humble family, uh, you know, blue collar workers. Uh, my family would have supported me going to school, but I knew that, you know, I wasn't gonna be the best steward of their resources at that time in my life. Um, but I also did have the, the desire to serve. You know, and I, I looking back, I wish that it had been more altruistic. I wish that it had been just that sense of, that sense of patriotism. But, you know, you put the uniform on, you meet people that join for all different types of reasons, right? You know, and, and I was blown away to see that people would come and fight for this country from other countries just to become a citizen, right? Some wanted adventure, some of them was legacy. Really, the reasons that we join almost don't matter as long as you become dedicated to the team when you get there uh, and you're dedicated to each other and, and the mission. Um, and service is just an incredible thing because you get so much more out of it than you give. You know, my fellow soldiers, everybody that I interacted with gave me so much more. Um, than I could have possibly imagined. And uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss my time in service uh, and that mission, that, that sense of purpose that we had um, every day. Great. Thank you for sharing. Britt? That's way better than your mom sending you to the recruiters because the life you're living wasn't what she and your dad put you to college for. We probably would have gotten there. <laughs> I mean, for me, I was just a kid in Western Massachusetts that, I mean, truth be told, I didn't have a really great home life, so I was just, I was just looking to, to get out of the house. My father had served in the Navy, but I, rather than go, go right into college, which in order for me to do, I would have had to stay at home in order to afford it, and I was like, look, I'm, I just needed, needed a change, and uh, that, that Navy seemed like it was the right challenge for me, and 
here we are. Yes, similar story. Uh, wasn't sure if, how I would do in college. Drove my motorcycle down to recruiting station, signed up. They still tried selling me. I'm like, I'm good. I'm just going to sign up. Went home, told my mom, signed up in the, for the Marine Corps. Went to boot camp, 17 years old, finished boot camp when I was 17, and you know, loved every, every minute of it. But you know, it's these uh, uh, different, different stories of how we get in and, and, and why. You know. Um, that was a good decision you made, by the way. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> if I was going to do it, I was going to do the best. Right, absolutely. Oh, boy. There we go. There we go. Every time. All right, next question <laughs> submitted from Richard Martinez. Can you share a defining moment or experience from your service that had a lasting impact on you? I mean, for me, it was, I, I think... Um, you know, that final battle that I was in, because that was the end of my military career, but just the incredible things that I watched everybody do around me, you know, people that didn't even know, like, I mean, it was understandable that those of us that trained together, deployed together, went to war together, you know, that we would be close and do everything for each other, but for these other units that we had never even met, you know, these men and women to risk their lives to, to come to our aid, um, you know, and, and I, it was after that day that it kind of dawned on me that it was just like I really saw the whole team for what it was because, you know, if there weren't logisticians getting the, the parts for all those aircraft and the mechanics working on them and the medics, nobody would have been coming to our aid that day, right? And I engaged with, you know, medical professionals from every branch on my way back through Longstool and, and Walter Reed um, and just realized, you know, the, the incredible people that we have that wear the uniform that are dedicated uh, to other people they don't even know. You know, I think... Uh, the thing that I really remember is when I took a man uh, of a company in combat and I started telling young Marines uh, what to do and they did exactly what I told them to do. I'd only been with that unit four days. They didn't know my name. I was a forward observer. Company commander got killed. I took over the company, started giving orders. Why did they follow my orders? I had a first lieutenant bar on my collar. And, and I think to, to see young men, and you know, they hit the deck and they were, they were scared. All I had to do was jumpstart those Marines. Tell them what to do. Follow me, lead by example. I didn't say go take that trench line. I said follow me, and I went before them. At that point, they did anything I told them to do. And the hard part was some of those Marines uh, didn't make, they got killed doing what I told them to do. But if they didn't do what I told them to do and they gave, paid the ultimate sacrifice, we wouldn't have been successful. So it's not about the individual, it's about the team. And you know, it's amazing to see what a young Marine will do for his brother Marine. And, and I, that's a lasting thing. I'll never forget that. And I have uh, stood in front of people who chastise uh, because uh, a young Marine did something. But you know, he did it um, uh, because of his training. He did it because he was told to do it. And if we didn't come together that day, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So it's, it's uh, you know, one team, one fight, is, is I hear my armor buddies use, but um, that's what it's all about. Uh, service before self. You know, you're not thinking of yourself. You think of the mission. The mission drives everything. But I also got to tell you, survival of the fittest is a strong motivator on the field of battle. So, but uh, I think that was a defining moment, and that, told me I ought to stay in this core and became a way of life, not a job. And uh, I always was an advocate for, for the troops. And uh, that's rewarding. The most rewarding thing for me was to tell troops, either in war or peacetime, this is what we gotta do, step back and watch them do it. <laughs> give them a little guidance, and uh, it's amazing what they'll do when you give them, give them the lead. Thank you, that was very powerful, thank you. Britt, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I echo those sentiments that 
the the whole process of, of just being in the in the military I, I can't say enough positive things about it. it it came at the right point in my life and just made me a much better human being by being exposed to all of those those friends and teammates just just made me a better human being so just so thankful for the experience before we go on to our next question, any want to see if there's any other questions from audience members? And if, if not now, I'll go to additional question. Feel free to go up to the mic and we'll get you called on. Next question. It takes a certain, this is a question submitted from Deb Silva. It takes a certain frame of mind to face your fear and still go forward knowing it may not end well for you. What advice would you give someone facing the same dilemma? Well, for me, if, if, I take, if I were to take you back to that moment when I'm making the decision to, to go and do the, the Medal of Honor action, th this was about trust in my teammates, right? I knew we were facing a difficult challenge, insurmountable odds, and maybe some of us wouldn't be coming back, but I had absolute faith in them, kind of had Barney alluded to. I knew we had the, the best training, a lot of faith in the team, so that, that helped me in that moment take a little bit of weight off your shoulders to say the team has this we can get this done and hence we went and executed it Great. Barney Ryan any thoughts to add well um, it's all about your training that's you know we train we train we train we train some more so when the flag goes up you get shot at I know what he's gonna do he knows what I'm gonna do I know what you're gonna do I know what you Everybody, it's like, you know, that day uh, that I took over that uh, company, I was like, I was walking down the field as a, f a member of a football team, and I'm a lineman. Linemen don't get much credit. When that company commander was shot and died, and I took over, I went from being a lineman to being a quarterback, and I called the plays, and I knew what plays to call because I'd only been out of basic school three and a half years. It's like the football team. You practice all week for the game on Saturday. And when the quarterback says 34A on three, everybody knows what they're going to do. You know what you're going to do? We do it. And together as a team, if we don't work together as a team and open up that hole as a football team, you're never going to score. So, um, and, and the Marines that I led were like that football team. They had trained and trained and trained, and, and I knew what training they'd had, even though they didn't know me, and I, they had trust and confidence in me. So it's all about team. It's not, there's no, you know, there's no I in the word team. Remember that, okay? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for me, courage isn't the absence of fear, it's the ability to move forward in the face of it. And you know, sometimes you can find that in yourself, but you know, for me on that day, it was also looking around at everybody around me. You know, these young kids, I was wounded, the other NCO at my position was wounded, and like Barney was saying, it's that training, right? Um, you, it becomes muscle memory. It takes kind of the, the thinking out of it. You know, there were times where it was just, I was looking around at the resources I had, what I had been taught, and then just trying to make that next impact. Um, you know, and drawn on those courage, that courage from the, those around me, right? There were nine guys that day that died fighting. You know, I felt it was my responsibility to at least try and match their commitment. Um, because if we didn't all give everything we had, none of us were going home. All right, thank you. And we have uh, one audience, a question uh, from the audience? Yeah, Jarvis Newsom. I just had an interesting question. Any organization is about what is accomplishment and the benefits of it. I'd like to know, you know and it's a two-part question. One is, what are the, between the association and the Medal of Honor themselves, what do you think the greatest two benefits that you get that you have done to make a difference? And then the second part of that is, what are the, th the two things you think you could have, you, we could do better f from the association to the, to the uh, uh, Medal of Honor? You're talking about the Medal of Honor Society? Yes, yeah. both. So I would say that the two things that the Medal of Honor Society does that I think most recipients are, the, are most proud of is our character development program. That is, uh, it's, a, it's a free program that we put, push press out to, to 
teachers, it's a train the trainer type of thing that we press out to schools all across the nation uh, to give teachers you know, another resource to teach character to, to their classes. And that, that, that program, I think, is one of our cornerstone programs that we have. And, and the other thing is what we're doing this evening is recognizing other acts of service and valor at our Citizen Honors Awards. That's happening this evening at the National Museum of the Army. And that's, that, that is just an incredible event when it's us. It's us as recipients get to recognize in, in citizens great acts of courage, value, and service to our fellow citizenry. So those are the two things that we, that we do that I, I think are, are really very important to us as recipients. What can we do better? Well, frankly, we, we can just do more of those two things. They're at issue to challenge, but to our, to our staff and to our team to say, make those two programs 20 times bigger in the next 24 months. You know, uh, being able to stand before and look youngsters in the eye, you know, the youth of our country are the future leaders. There are, there's a young man someday who's going to take your job. So what do we got to do? We got to prepare him to take your job. So I, I challenge them. I tell them to set their goals high, always reach out for, you know, as you're climbing that ladder of life, set your goals up and, and don't stop. And if something doesn't work, you don't quit. Remember, there's no, don't use the word failure. You stop, you back up, and you try something else. And if that doesn't work, you go to somebody else and say, I, I've tried this, I tried, would you help me? Don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's mental health, physical health, or getting the job done, because you're gonna find someone out there who's been there and done it. So, the, we gotta take care, of the, really push the youth of our country, and get a little more discipline in their lives. Uh, moral and, and, and I, I just, the, the, the morals of our country are going to hell in a handbasket. We got to grab them, but it, stack and swivel and rein them in and talk to them like that. You know, I, 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 th I think our youth likes to know that someone cares and they're listening. And the other thing, when you're dealing with youth, say a few things and sit back, let them talk. Let them talk. And then you reply, you respond to them. You know, a problem that a young kid has got, he thinks it's this big. And you find out about it, and to you, it's that big. So, but to him, it's a big one. So you got to know how to, how to guide, kick in the butt, get them going, and, and put reins on them. So um, I, I think we've got to be a little more firmer with the youth of our country. And you know what? I think they respect that. I think they want it because it shows we care. Isn't that right, Gary? <laughs> All right, thank you, Ryan. Anything you want to add? To this? I don't think I can. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Absolutely. All right, we have one more audience question. Sonetta? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you all for your service. You all have gone through some harrowing situations and you know, you talked about what, what you pulled from to get through those situations. My question is for what, what have you pulled from afterwards to keep going? What, what, what strength or what, what thing inside of you has kept you going to be able to do the advocacy work that you're doing and to be an inspiration to other people? You did a great job singing the national anthem. <laughs> and I want to present my challenge to our All right? Oh. <laughs> Zanetta, would you mind just restating your yeah. question? So, would it be easier if I said, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. All right, so what, what strength did you draw from to continue? What strength have you drawn from to continue going forward? We know that you know many of our service members struggle with you know once they get home and in their thoughts they're they're just there and they don't they don't get back out and start serving and doing things what have you all pulled from well you know i think it it starts with uh, your mom and your dad your priest your coach um 
you know, when you build a house, you have to have a strong foundation, okay? The foundation is your youth, your mom, your dad, the priest, your football coach. And then you start to put walls up, okay? That's, that's your schooling. And, and then at the end of your schooling, at the end of building this house, you put a roof on it. Well, if you don't have a strong foundation, the walls are going to fall down and the roof's going to fall down. So we got to start and make sure we got a strong foundation with our children, with the leadership of the country. Um, and I use that analogy with some kids, and you know what, they understand it. Because oftentimes we, we, we're talking to children, and we're talking like we're talking to each other, and we're over their heads. Uh, not by design, but it's, it just happens. So I use that analogy. And uh, make sure you've got that strong foundation. And most of the kids I talked to were just, the foundation is already there to put the, the, the wall up. So we, we hope that they got a strong foundation. But anyways, I think that analogy is, a, it says a lot. And, and, and when you're talking to the youth, they understand stuff like that. We can't use these big words from philosophy and, and stuff like that. So, and I think that's, that's where we got to start, yeah. You know, you can't go through the things that we, we go through in the military, the, these very kinetic experiences. Um, of course, all, we're all, all volunteer force, but you can't go through these events without them having some impact on you as a person. And then we're not immune to that, right? If you come on up here and you put your finger right here, you, you'll see I, we, we have a pulse too, just like everyone else. And we, we do feel it, right? We, we, we are human. But, you, but we, we still have to w realize, and I guess this is the message I send to, to all the veterans that are listening out there, to say you're not alone. That weight that you're feeling, that you, you think you're alone and, and there's not another step left in front of you, you're, you're not alone, right? There, there is a team waiting there to help you feel some joy in this life. We didn't go through everything that we went through in the past 20 years to feel miserable, right? Our teammates would not want that for us. So I'd ask for you to, hey, take that step, right? And go out and ask your teammates, hey, for help, or at least tell them what you're feeling, right? They will listen, because after all, we, we are all, all human. Chris, uh, let me add to that. And to all the veterans that are listening, I know you've, uh, you're Rambos and you're hard and you're tough, grizzly, um, and you don't want to admit sometimes that you got a problem. Well, you can't fix the problem unless you ask for help. And when you ask for help, especially uh, physical and mental, the VA is here. So I know you're a Rambos, you've seen a lot, you're rough and you're tough, but you're hurting, and you're hurting within. If you don't step up and admit it to yourself, we can't help you. The VA can't help you. So, you know, if you can be a bear, be a grizzly bear, okay? Do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, and that's ask for help. You ask for help, you're going to get it. I want, I want that clipped out. I want a commercial from Barney to all of our veterans. So public affairs, pulley, do your magic. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, you know, just coming out, the biggest source of um, motivation and inspiration for me were the, you know, the guys that we lost, uh, because I think we have a responsibility. If we made it to come back and live lives worthy of their sacrifice, to make the the most of the gift that they gave to us, you know. And I think the other part too is I think about lessons I learned from you know the first first sergeant I had, um, you know, when he said you know leave an organization better than you, you found it, and you can always be better tomorrow than you are today. So just that continuing to set goals and push the envelope. You know, like Barney said, you don't quit, but maybe sometimes you gotta reorganize and, and, and re-attack. On the subject of mental health, when I think of mental health, um, you know, I'm somebody that has gone to the VA for mental health care. I talk about it, I'm an advocate for it. I encourage veterans, you know, when comfortable, you know, talk about it. That's, that's how we normalize it, right? You know, it's, um, it's just an invisible wound, right? And I, I think when you go get help, and then talk about it, you still have an opportunity to lead 
in that sense and inspire others and tell them it's okay, right? I look at it as it's that, you know, 10 foot wall and basic training that everybody's gotta go over. You're not getting over by yourself. Somebody's gotta help you up there and that's okay. Cause we didn't do anything in, our, in the service on our own. You know, we had a team around us, but you going and getting that help puts you on the top of the wall. Now it's your turn to turn around, lower your hand and pull somebody up behind you. That'll be our third commercial. I was privileged when I was at the White House to um, participate on the actual Medal of Honor ceremonies and behind the scenes, getting folks prepped, getting them over to do their first media tours and all of that. I had one recipient in one of the meetings say, you're asking me to relive the worst day of my life over and over again. Um, how do you balance that piece of such a hard day and um, being able to do the advocacy afterwards and I hope we give you time to work through that process. Well, um, none of us like to sit and hear our, our citations read because it does remind us of the worst day. But we go forth and we let it happen because if we can, through reading our citation and then talking with us, if we can help one person in this room, today is worth it, okay? One veteran out there, if he says, you know what, I'm going to go to the VA because I got this problem, it's worth it. If I talk with 300 kids in the room, if I get through to one of them, but, and that's, I'll let this all happen because we use it as a tool, a tool to get everybody else's attention. And it's pretty hard when everybody's patting you on the back all the time, okay? And it, 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 it gets emotional. But if we, we're not being used, but if we are a, an avenue to get through to people, to help them to be a great, better American, healthier American, then we're willing to do it. All of us, everybody, 63 living recipients, they're willing to do that. Uh, there's a few that don't. They don't go out and speak. They're very private, and they hold that dear to their heart. But you know, uh, they've done as much for this country as we have. And we got to respect that, we, and we do. Fellow recipients respect those who don't want to come out. And, and then I, I tell uh, people who tr keep trying to get them to do something, I say, whoa, whoa, okay, that's it. He said no, the answer is no, no means no. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's a tough thing, but it, it helps us uh, do the right thing and help other people. Uh, and, and it's all about us, okay? We're America. This room, this is America. And those kids that we talk to are the future leaders. They're going to be the admirals, the generals, the congressmen, senators, doctors, firemen, policemen. So, uh, again, that strong foundation and strong walls. So, um, we just got to move out smartly all the time, okay? All right, thank you, gentlemen. That was very touching. Thank you. Um, we have time for, I think, one more quick question, um, and kind of on the, the light end. Uh, this question was submitted from an anonymous employee, but we all love to share our military stories and experiences. What would be a favorite story of a military experience that you guys would like to share, or anything uh, at all as we uh, close our fireside chat? Okay. okay. No. I've got to, okay, I've got <laughs> I've got a funny one for you. So since you were at a White House ceremony, I'll share one from the White House ceremony. Anybody want to hear this one? Okay, so we are, you know, you're sitting in the, in the, in the, like in the blue room getting ready, and you're standing there with the president, and you're having some small talk, and, the, and, and we walk out, and we're, we're, there's the, the red carpet, and you're, you're going in the room, and you're minutes away from the, from the ceremony. And standing right next to the president is the naval aide 
and his naval aide has the medal and he's holding on to the medal and he's going to walk into the into the room with the thing and you know most of us i'm sure you guys were the same my, my head is an absolute mess like i'm wondering like what am i doing here like i'm in the wrong place i shouldn't be here everything in my body is telling me to just run away right now um and as this is going on very much tunnel vision going on uh the metal on the back of it has three very distinct clasps snaps right um so the naval aid leads over to me and you can imagine this picture right and he's he's hold, he's holding on to the metal we're getting ready to walk in and he leans over to me and he says hey just be ready to catch it in case he drops it <laughs> and i look at him i'm like really Yeah, so when you, if, you, if you look at my ceremony and you wonder what's going on in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm rigid like this, thinking, just catch it, just catch it. Thank you for sharing, Britt. <laughs> well, uh, Deputy Secretary, gentlemen, I want to thank you for engaging with our audience today. Uh, for those that are watching live, we're concluding our formal program. However, please feel free to stay on as we recognize Medal of Honor program team, as well as others who have supported the program. So at this time, we're gonna go ahead and transition into calling up our awardees. I think we're going to, yes, no, stand, Debbie, yep. Debbie says yes. I listen to Debbie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, at this time I'd like to call up uh, the Medal of Honor program team, starting with first with Debbie Bevins. Director of Client Relations, and Al Bevins, your daughter Debbie, says hello. Nancy Lee, Deputy Director of Client Relations. Jennifer Kogut, National Director, VA Social Work. Alice and Tricken, Assistant Chief Social Work. Yeah. Annette Field, Executive Director at Duchamp. Yeah. And Jennifer Silva, National Social Work Program Manager. And the citation reads, in recognition of outstanding contributions to the Department of Veterans Affairs, Medal of Honor recipient program, your unparalleled leadership across the organization and exemplary dedication to duty was invaluable in establishing the VA Medal of Honor recipient program, ensuring our nation's heroes and their families receive world-class exceptional care. Your selfless service has contributed to VA's mission to care for those who have borne the battle and reflects great credit upon you, the National Social Work Program, Care Management and Social Work Services, the Veterans Experience Office, and the Department. Congratulations to you all.
great, thank you. 31. 31. 31. And three. I appreciate it. within weeks pulled together and said we got it and they just with the help of VHA with the help of VBA just absolutely did a phenomenal job and reached out to each and every Medal of Honor recipient and it is an indeed an honor and a privilege and so grateful um, to assist the society in providing for our veterans. And so um, the other piece is we had veterans, Medal of Honor recipients throughout the country who weren't connected with their medical centers. And so we were able to identify which medical centers actually staff them and being able to make sure when they walk in that they were identified and the staff knew exactly who they were. And so if you ever have any issues, let us know. But um, it's just an honor and a privilege. And I'm just so appreciative to the team because they really just pulled it together so fast. So thank you. Go down on behalf of all my fellow recipients for doing this and get together as a team and making it happen. Is that ma'am? Mm -hmm. In addition to our awardees, I would also like to give a special thanks to the following for their instrumental support as the department's champions for the Medal of Honor program team and the development of the Medal of Honor program. VA leadership, Deputy Secretary Bradshaw, John Borsler, Veterans Experience Office, and Dr. Steve Lieberman. VBA colleagues who are in the audience today, all the way from St. Paul, Regional Office Director Kim Graves, Jillian Wright, Angela Kendricks, Lamont Saxon, Kimberly White. And of course, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, Britt Slobinski and Jane Barnes. Additionally, I'd also like to thank VHA social workers and case managers who are watching online today and have provided direct health care support to our Medal of Honor recipients across the country. At this time, at this time, I would like to ask Britt to come up. Well, everyone, what a privilege to be in your presence today. Um, Deputy Secretary, the Medal of Honor team, everyone listen, I just want to say, I speak on behalf of all the recipients to say we truly believe that we're nobody special, right? We, we were just put in a, in a spot and we were the one that was called on at the time and we did what needed to do because we had the strength of our team around us to make the decisions that we did. So as president of the society, I just wanted to also give a little a little bit of thanks to, to the team from a little plaque from all the recipients, uh, just to say thank you for being such magnificent teammates on this journey of life. Thank you. And before we conclude our event, I would like to thank Deputy Secretary Bradshaw for attending and a special thank you to our panel of Medal of Honor recipients for sharing their experiences, insights, and words.
that inspire us all. Thank you for joining, and thank you for your service. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.